Well, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Morton Blackwell, and I'm president of the Leadership Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this, our last Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast of the year 2002. We live in interesting times. This morning, uh, after I got into this room, uh, Leadership Institute donor and and very faithful and regular uh, participant in these Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast, Carol George came to me at, and handed me a magazine, which she said was a gift to me that I might be able to use. And the magazine uh, is the American Enterprise uh, magazine, and there's a story in the magazine of surveys that they did with respect to college faculties at well-known colleges all around the country, and they checked on the party registration of the professors. And uh, the first two of many pages lists Brown University and Cornell University, and uh, they, uh, they were looking for people in economics, engineering, English history, political science, sociology, anthropology, uh, psychology, uh, women's studies, etc. Brown University, the article said, had 54 professors who were registered in a party of the left and three registered in a party of the right. Cornell University, in their survey, had 166 professors registered in a party of the left and six in a party of the right. And that plays in very well with something that I found earlier this morning in the Washington Times. Now, the Institute donors and graduates know because we have talked about it, um, about the background to what was a, became a famous event immediately after September 11th, 2001. A professor came into a University of New Mexico freshman history class, a professor named Richard Berthold, and to the shock and horror after the terrorist attacks, told his students, quote, anyone who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote. Now, we all heard that. Uh, many times we heard it. We even saw Professor Berthold <coughs> Uh, on TV in the days immediately following that. What many people uh, uh, don't know, less well known, but reasonably well known, is the fact that the, the student who blew the whistle on him was a girl named Sarah Hunt. Well, the story was, was as follows. She was so horrified when she heard this thing that she, ca she called the Leadership Institute. She was a graduate of the Leadership Institute, and she was uh, active in a uh, campus leadership program group of the Leadership Institute. She called our staff and said, this is horrible, what should I do? And the staff contacted me, called me immediately, and I said, uh, tell her that this is a wonderful opportunity for her to take advantage of the fact that moral outrage is the most uh, powerful influence in politics. It's seldom engaged, but when it is engaged, it tends to sweep all else before it. Um, work with her on a news release uh, to go out to the local media and to the wire services and have her personally take it down to the news outlets, print and broadcast, and uh, explain how horrified she was. And she went down and boom! national news stories. She was interviewed on national uh, news programs, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, Professor Berthold had a considerable problem. He appeared a couple of times on national television trying to defend what he said, et cetera. Now, never in the national news coverage, even that which Sarah Hunt got, was it mentioned that she was a graduate of the Leadership Institute and a member of a campus leadership program, conservative independent student group uh, on that campus. But that's in common with most of what the Leadership Institute does because we uh, do not uh, seek publicity about 
most of what we do. The truth of the matter is I would be delighted to have publicity about the campus leadership program, but we haven't yet contrived how to do that. However, that brings me to this morning's paper, the Washington Times. <clears throat> a University of New Mexico history professor who was heavily criticized for telling a class on the day of the terrorist attacks, quote, anyone who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote, is retiring this month complaining of constant harassment. <laughs> Richard Berthold, a 55-year-old tenured professor, was forced to apologize for the remark, which he called, quote, an incredibly stupid joke. The university also barred him from teaching freshmen. Yeah. Quote, constant harassment by persons in authority at the university is now driving me into retirement, he said in a statement Monday. He has taught at the university for 30 years. Provo Marsh Brian Foster at the University of New Mexico said Mr. Berthold is not being forced out. We do live in interesting times. Um, in 2002, thus far, the Leadership Institute has trained 2,891 students in 106 schools, and we have placed 50 job seekers directly through our employment placement service and helped many others find jobs uh, indirectly. And you have before you uh, our remaining 2002 school schedule uh, in front of every seat, and I would urge that you take a moment to review the calendar and consider attending one of our December programs or recommending people you know to attend these remaining programs. We, we are confident that we will end the year uh, again with over 3,000 students uh, attending the Leadership Institute in 2002. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Austin Vann for an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Austin is an intern here at the Leadership Institute at, at our campus leadership program. And uh, this intern uh, class is about over, and, and I don't know yet what Austin is going to be doing afterwards, but he's certainly been a wonderful intern for us. He'll graduate from Dallas Baptist University in the spring, and shortly after that will begin his graduate studies in divinity at Southwestern Baptist <laughs> Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, where he hopes to prepare for an Army chaplaincy. Upon graduation, Austin will be also uh, commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Austin. If I might uh, re reiterate, reiterate really quickly, uh, we do live in interesting times. Um, I heard a story from Billy Graham in his last crusade in Dallas who's talking about his relationship with the Bush family and how um, you know he couldn't catch up to George W um, in, a, in racing boats and so that's an interesting story um, Billy Graham chasing George W in uh, some some boats out in the sea in Massachusetts in, uh, in Maine but anyway um, <clears throat> pray with me if you want Father God we come humbly come before you today with Thanksgiving to recognize your blessings on our great nation. We realize your providence at its founding. Continue to bless us, Lord, as we renew our commitment to you. Father God, thank you for our President George W. Bush, who unashamedly calls you Savior and Lord. Place in him and our other government officials the wisdom and discernment needed to bring America through the trials of the new millennium. Thank you for the Leadership Institute and its belief in the necessity of, of, the, of God in the political process. Help us to fight the moral entropy in our nation. Bless this assembly and our speaker in a mighty way with your all-sufficient power and show us how to love each other as you loved us. We pray these things in your name, Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Join with me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Austin. 
And now I introduce Matt Lewis for an update on the grassroots department here at the Leadership Institute. Matt is director of the Grassroots Activist School, um, where he has helped train candidates and activists all across the nation to win, and you will hear things about that. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Grassroots Activist School, under Matt's leadership, um, became our number one school of attendance at the Leadership Institute for the first time. Um, our Youth Leadership School was not the school that drew the most students, and the Grassroots Activist School is extremely strong, uh, extremely effective, as uh, you will hear uh, in the brief uh, re remarks that he is going to make. Before coming here, Matt worked as a consultant for a 26-year-old Institute graduate named Alex Mooney and helped Alex become the youngest Republican ever elected to the Maryland State Senate. And as you may recall and probably saw in local papers, um, despite a massive and, co and a complex and convoluted effort to uh, defeat him, Alex was reelected last month. In 2002, Campaigns and Election Magazine selected our Matt Lewis as, quote, a rising star in politics. Matt Lewis. Well, though, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit, first of all, about what the Grassroots Activist School is. Many of you have probably been to it, but some of you may not have been to it yet. Basically, what it is, it's a two-day crash course in how to run a grassroots campaign. And it really is a crash course. We talk about pretty much everything from, you know, how do you develop your message, your strategy, how do you organize and motivate volunteers, and things such as how would you go door to door if you wanted to run for office or fight for a cause you believed in? How do you do phone programs? And how do you raise enough money to actually be successful? So that's what we do. And I just wanted to briefly tell you about some of our successes that we've had this past year, 2002. And one of the things that we, I, I kind of just want to highlight on a couple things we've done. One is the state of Georgia. We've had some tremendous success with our graduates in Georgia. And if you click. Uh, in Georgia, we had 16 of our grassroots activist school graduates were elected to the Georgia State House for the first time. And that was a tremendous success. And one of them, a fellow by the name of Matt Dollar, was only 24 years old. So that was very good. And maybe most impressive is a fellow named Bill Heath, who was 42 years old defeated the incumbent Speaker of the House in Georgia, who had been in office for 42 years himself. So it was amazing. And of course, you know, I feel like the training that, that we provided conservatives helped many of them be successful. Another of the areas we did really good this past year was Missouri. And keep in mind, you know, we go all over the country, you know, and, but I think these are probably two of the states that I really wanted to highlight to you. Uh, in Missouri, we had 16 of our graduates also were elected for the first time to the Missouri State House. And one of our graduates, Rod Jetton, who's been to a lot of different Leadership Institute schools, including the Grassroots School, but I know he's been to some of, many of our schools, was elected Speaker Pro Tem after his first term in office. That's basically the second highest position that he could have. So we've had tremendous success in Georgia and Missouri. We've had a lot of other successes are all over the country and we're hoping to duplicate some of these. One of the things I'd like to do is take this time to thank the donors of the Leadership Institute because I have to tell you that when we go around the country and we look at you know in the eyes of students that are there and maybe you know they're running for school board and the, the, the teachers union has been training and giving money to their opponents and helping their opponents, their liberal opponents, and then I see the light bulb go off in these students' minds in their head and you know that they've gotten it and that they're going to go door to door and they're going to recruit volunteers. It's just so amazing and it's the donors that make it possible and I want you to join me in, if, if you are donors or if, if you know donors or if you'd like to become donors, I'd like to give the donors to the Leadership Institute a round of applause.
because we, we truly could not do what we do uh, and the successes that you've seen without the donors. I wanted to show you, you know, briefly what we've done. This is our five-year anniversary of the Grassroots Activist School, and it's been tremendous. Our first year, 1998, we trained 454 students. And, you know, I always say, numbers are important. The more students we can train, the better, but, you know, you might train a school with 10 students, but one of them grows up to be the next president of the United States or something. So it's also, we also uh, make it a point to strive for quality. But as you can see, every year we've trained more and more students than we have the previous year. But you might be able to see that I have a bit of a dilemma right now and that we have about a month left to go and I still need 54 more students trained this year before we can break last year's record. I'm confident we will do it. But when I looked at this, it actually reminded me of a story that Ronald Reagan used to tell about Sir Winston Churchill in times like these. And, and the story goes that Sir Winston Churchill was speaking at the Women's Temperance Organization, believe it or not, in 1953 at the Savoy Hotel. And the president of the Ladies' Temperance Movement was about to introduce uh, Winston Churchill to speak. And in her introduction, she said, although we admire your statesmanship, Mr. Churchill, and we do admire what you've done, we do have a problem. We don't agree with, with your drinking. And, you know, in fact, we've conducted a study, and we believe it, that it's true, according to our calculations, that, you know, if, if we took all the liquor, all the wine, and, and everything that you've drank during the course of your life and just poured it into this room, it would come right about up to your chin. And, you know, I'm, what a way to introduce somebody. I, I thank you for not introducing me that way. <laughs> But so, you know, Winston Churchill gets up and, and is about to, to make his remarks. And, and he says, you know, thank you very much for having me here. And I cannot argue with the calculations that you've come up with. And <laughs> the accuracy of your calculations is very good. But he said, you know, being 78 years old and considering the height of the ceilingless ballroom in my 78 years here on earth, I have only one thing left to say. How much left to do? and how little time left to do it. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel looking <laughs> at what we have left to do with this month to go. Uh, Demosthenes, Demosthenes, who was a, a great Athenian orator, uh, was asked, what are the three things that make for a great speech? And he said, the three things are action, action, and action. And that's what I want to ask for your help today. Uh, mostly what I wanted to do is just brief you on the successes that we've had in 2002, but I also wanted to ask you for your help and to take some action. This Saturday and Sunday, we're having a grassroots activist school. You'll see the green flyer that each of you has. I would just like to ask your help and, and encourage you that if you know somebody, if there's, you know, if you haven't been to the grassroots school or if you have a, a son or daughter or a grandson or daughter or a friend that could benefit from learning Morton Blackwell's techniques of how to advance the conservative movement, I encourage you to have them call me. And as you can see, my information is right up there. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you. Thank you very much. Matt, Matt is doing a great job, and uh, we're proud to have him, and the nation's fortunate that he is here doing what he is doing. And now, to introduce the man who will introduce our featured speaker of the morning. Mr. Richard Vigory is president of American Target Advertising. He pioneered political ideological direct mail in the 1960s and 70s, and his work enabled grassroots Americans to participate in the political process to a greater degree than ever before. John F. Kennedy Jr.'s magazine, George, listed Richard Vigory's effort and success as number 64 on the list of the defining political moments of the 20th century. I would list it considerably higher. Mr. Vigory is now pioneering uh, the use of the Internet on behalf of conservative free market politicians and organizations. Washington Post called him the Conservative's Voice of America. National Review credited him with forming dozens of conservative organizations. 
In the spring of 1972, having heard of Richard Viguerie for many years, a mutual friend, Lee Edwards, introduced us, and we had lunch at the Mayflower Hotel. Some days later, Mr. Viguerie invited me back to lunch at the Mayflower Hotel and offered me a job with his company. And at the time, I had the first really good paying job I had ever had in my whole life. I was at the American Enterprise Institute, and, uh, and I had, uh, um, in fact, I'd been there for not quite a year and a half, and finally figured that I was financially secure enough that I could propose to Helen to get married in, in December. But this was, this was uh, in, I guess, early May, and Helen and I were being uh, married in late May, and Richard uh, took me out uh, to breakfast again at the Mayflower, and he outlined uh, what he was doing, and he used with me the magic words, which were, Morton, I would like for you to come help me build a conservative movement. And those words had an immense impact on me, because that's what I wanted to do most in life, and that's been my uh, lifelong career since I became politically awake in the upsurge for Barry Goldwater. And here it was, an offer. And he offered me a slight raise over what I was getting at the American Enterprise Institute. I certainly didn't tell him at the time, but the truth is I would have taken a substantial pay cut uh, to go work for, for Mr. Vigory. And I learned there what many others have learned, um, uh, direct mail technology. Maybe three or four years ago, Richard and his wife came and visited Helen and me at uh, for a meal at the Briar Patch. He has a home uh, in a uh, farm in Rappahannock County, and we have a cabin in Madison County, in the adjacent county. And Richard said, there are those who say that all these years I have been running a direct mail uh, uh, firm, but in fact, Morton, I've been running a direct mail university, and which is true. He, says he's, he said, I'm the only uh, person that I can think of who has, who has uh, hired and trained a, an entire uh, industry to go into competition with himself. And it's astonishing how many people, how many organizations uh, he has done, uh, he, has, he has helped and helped build. And uh, less than a month ago, we had our election night party in this room, and I stood here thanking Mr. Vigory for being our uh, co-sponsor with the Leadership Institute of this event, his American Target Advertising co-sponsored it, as, as they have done often. And in thanking him, I, I dubbed a new title on him, which I hope will stick because it is deserved. I called Richard Vigory the funding father of the conservative movement. And he's now going to introduce the speaker, Richard. Thank you, Morton. Uh, it's always a Pleasure to be here uh, on these Wednesday morning uh, breakfasts. Uh, previous speakers have uh, made reference to the fact that we uh, live in interesting times, and uh, Matt uh, mentioned uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, so I'm going to combine those two just briefly. Uh, Winston Churchill was very fond of a 19th century predecessor of his uh, who was little known. But Churchill thought he was a great prime minister, but uh, very few people had ever heard of him. Uh, and Churchill said the reason few people have ever heard of my predecessor from the 19th century is that he had the misfortune of living in uninteresting times. We do not live <laughs> in an uninteresting times. I think there's a Chinese uh, proverb about may you live in interesting times and I can't think of a time uh, in the last you know thousand years that's be more exciting uh, to uh, to live in the opportunities to to make a difference is just enormous uh, it's a real pleasure excuse me it's a privilege and an honor privilege and an honor I, I take away the pleasure privilege and an honor to introduce my friend Jim Morton today. The reason it is not a pleasure, Jim, because at 5 o'clock this morning, <laughs> 10 degrees in Rappahannock, <laughs> I could think of a few things I'd rather be doing. Could we do lunch maybe or dinner next time? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I did have uh, the pleasure of uh, first getting to know Jim uh, about 35 years ago. Uh, he was, uh, uh, I don't know if they still use these uh, terms anymore, AA, <laughs> administrative assistant to a uh, uh, rising uh, star, up-and-coming young congressman from uh, Florida, Ed Gurney. And uh, Congressman Gurney was uh, getting ready to run for the U.S. Senate from uh, Florida, and Jim asked me if I uh, thought I could help him raise some money. Well, I did, and uh, raised him a little bit of money, but Gurney uh, won, I think, by 59 points that year, a landslide uh, in anybody's uh, terms. And uh, after the election, we had a chance to catch our breath, and uh, Jim gave me a call, and uh, uh, we soon found ourselves uh, with our wives uh, heading to uh, a wonderful uh, resort south of here, Tides Inn, to play golf. And it uh, maybe was the first of well over a thousand golf games. <laughs> and Jim and I are famous for, uh, as Earl Chester over there can testify to our, and Earl's played most all those thousand games with us too, by the way. But we had noted for uh, interesting bets. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Jim and I drive up, and there's this beautiful golf course in front of us. I mean, it's spectacular, and we've played it many times since then. Uh, nobody on the golf course, so boy, we, you know, park the wives at the hotel room and run to the golf course, and after a little while, we figured out why nobody was on the golf course. I mean, the biggest, blackest clouds came <laughs> over there, and we were on about the third tee, and getting ready to tee off, and f right in front of us, like 100 yards in front of us, five fingers of lightning came down, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, Jim didn't say anything to me. I didn't say anything to him. And uh, he, uh, uh, we both just uh, got in that court and went right back to the, uh, uh, to the golf lodge and uh, continued our golf game another day. It was almost the end of our, our golf uh, uh, history there. But uh, I, I want to mention that uh, back in 67, uh, when uh, Jim was working for Ed Gurney, the Senate race, uh, a fellow named Jim Allison, uh, who uh, ended up as a consultant to uh, Congressman Gurney in the Senate race, who, uh, interesting enough, was a uh, consultant to uh, uh, pre former President uh, George Bush, uh, who later uh, uh, died of, of cancer, as did his uh, later his predecessor, uh, Lee Atwater. It's kind of interesting that two of the key political people to uh, first President Bush, uh, wonderful uh, conservative uh, strategists, both died of cancer. So before there was Karl Rove, there was uh, Lee Atwater, which you know, but before Lee Atwater was a wonderful uh, uh, man named uh, Jim Allison. But anyway, uh, Allison calls uh, Jim Martin one day and says, uh, uh, this congressman from Texas has got a young son who uh, uh, needs a job. And uh, you think you got anything for him? He says, well, I don't know. Send him over here. We'll find something for him to do. So uh, for the next year or so, uh, the President of the United States uh, worked for, for Jim. Uh, and in those days, Jim, it's hard to believe, literally, it's not an exaggeration, literally weighed 300 pounds. <laughs> this little man before you here did. And you ever try to ride in a golf court with a man that weighed 300 pounds? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, the, uh, the future president... Uh, Gave him a nickname of uh, of Buddha. Uh, can't understand why he would do that. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, like Morton, about the same time, as a matter of fact, uh, Jim uh, uh, came to uh, work at the Vigory Company, as it was called in those days, and uh, became vice president of the political division. And uh, with Morton and Jim and a lot of others, we had a wonderful time uh, building the cons helping to build the conservative movement back in the uh, in the 70s. Uh, Jim and I. Uh, as well as Morton worked, you know, for people like uh, raising money and helping uh, get him uh, votes. Uh, Strom Thurmond, Jesse Helms, Orrin Hatch, uh, a young up-and-coming conservative Democrat from Texas named Phil Graham. And uh, by the way, some of my favorite uh, conservatives are former Democrats. Phil Graham, Jesse Helms, Ronald Reagan, Bill Bennett. There's something about... Uh, uh, starting life as a Democrat, you seem like you're a little tougher, you're a little stronger, you understand politics uh, with an edge that a lot of uh, Republicans uh, don't have the benefit of. Anyway, uh, we now get into the 80s, and uh, I had something working on my mind for a long time. I started uh, uh, even before Morton did back in the 50s as a young Republican in, uh, in Houston, Harris County. And uh, it occurred to me early on, 
that uh, maybe the major reason, if you get beyond media bias, the, that we were having our heads handed to us, election in and election out, was uh, the demagoguery of the left on senior citizens' issues, that we were going to uh, throw grandma out in the snow and unplug grandpa's machine, and uh, we just really hated old people. And uh, the Democrats, you know, have won a lot of elections uh, by demagoguing uh, on that issue. Uh, they, uh, they beat Jeb Bush uh, by demagoguing that issue uh, the first time he ran for governor of, of Florida. And uh, so I began to formulate my idea that we really needed some conservative uh, groups uh, dealing with seniors' issues to try to level that playing field. And uh, was uh, uh, instrumental in helping to start a number of seniors' organizations and uh, uh, asked Jim to get involved in one of them, United Seniors Association, and he did. And uh, that was going well, and then we had the opportunity to help start another one, uh, which turned out to be 60-plus. And I asked Jim if he thought he'd like to, to run the organization, and he did. And uh, uh, very quickly, I uh, had very little to do with it, and Jim uh, took that organization and has made a major difference. Uh, I'd hate to think where the conservative cause would be right now if we had not, as conservatives, with a lot of help from, uh, from others, including elected officials, but we have leveled the playing field so much now that it's uh, consistent uh, for conservatives to Republicans to get a majority uh, of seniors' uh, votes. And that wasn't the case back in the, uh, in the <coughs> excuse me, got one of those grits uh, there, Morton. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm a Cajun just like Morton. <laughs> and I uh, love my grits. And I uh, uh, beg pardon? Yeah, great. <laughs> I, uh, I have a four-year-old granddaughter visiting me. Uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, I introduced her to uh, Grits last weekend. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, the, the, the playing field has, has changed for conservatives on this issue to a large extent because of uh, uh, conservatives like Jim Martin providing the leadership out there. William James said that, uh, thank you, a, uh, a small force uh, can achieve far greater results than a much larger force if the small force never, never gives up and just is doggedly and determined and the larger force acts intermittently and, and hesitantly. And uh, early on, when uh, Jim uh, uh, started 60-plus, uh, he, uh, he recognized one of the major successful ingredients of, of marketing, and that is to narrow your focus narrow your focus, and he began to focus on uh, the inheritance tax. <coughs> and uh, uh, Jim uh, gets the credit, as he should, for coining the phrase. You're very fortunate to uh, coin anything in life, a phrase, and one that's so popular uh, in the uh, public arena today. It's, it's amazing, but Jim uh, came up with the idea of, of the death tax. and. Uh, so much so that now it's an unusual uh, Democrat that doesn't uh, favor it, uh, at least at, at election time. So uh, uh, Jim's life has made a difference, and Jim, we're all very much in your debt, and thank you for all that you've done to uh, help the conservatives advance uh, the cause of freedom. Thank you. You want to turn it off. I don't know how to do this. You want to turn it off. Ain't high tech wonderful? <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Richard, and uh, let me dispel a couple of things real quickly before I get into the meat of the topic, which is dying should not be a taxable event, and tell you why we came up with that name. But first of all, uh, Richard, I do thank you for that introduction. That's one of the better ones I've had. Uh, 
Maybe the best one I've had since the fellow was supposed to introduce me didn't show up. I had to introduce myself. So uh, I do thank you. I um, want to say about hiring George W. Bush, yeah, it was an honor. And, and I've been asked many times about that, and did I know where he was going? Well, no, I didn't have a crystal ball back in those days. Uh, let me put it this way. A lot of you in this room can remember back to 1968. Seems like yesterday to some of us. His father that year, when they said, did you know where a young Bush was headed? No. Remember, his father that year was in his first term in the House of Representatives. So who knew where Pop was going, let alone Junior, and we did sometimes call him Junior in those days. Um, and by the way, uh, if my legacy after 40 years in this town is that I gave a future president of the United States a job, there are lots worse legacies to have in Washington, D.C., <laughs> I can assure you. Um, I had a lot of remarks about the death tax, and time is running short. I, we passed out an awful lot of information, more than you'll ever want to know about the 60-plus association and about the origin of the term, the death tax. But I've always said, learning from Richard Vigory and Morton, the more you tell, the more you sell. It's an old advertising axiom, so we wanted to give you plenty of material. But I would mention a couple of things. First of all, today's topic, dying should not be a taxable event. Why do we name it the death tax? Well, consider the title, the Federal Estate Gift and Generation Skipping Transfer Tax. Rather mind-numbing, isn't it? The whole title. So we started calling it death tax for short. Um, it uh, drives our opponents to distraction. As they've said many times in, a, in one of the articles you have there, that they didn't know how to counter that. They want to call it the estate tax, the rich man's tax. We call it the death tax. And uh, I'll just give you a couple of short anecdotes about how we've driven it from one goal line to the other to finally get repealed. It took about 10 years to do that. And a lot of that's mentioned in these stories. But let me, let me mention that one story. Uh, you've got an article there called Mr. Death. Uh, by Joshua Green of the American Prospect magazine. Now, interesting little story, and everybody in this room, I think, can pick up on this, being conservatives. The American Prospect, it may be the most liberal publication in the country. Uh, when Joshua Green called me about a year ago, uh, he said, uh, somebody came in and said, Jim, there's a fellow on the phone. He wants to talk to you about how you came up with the term death tax. And I, being a known newspaper reporter myself, I said, get his name. I usually like to check out who I'm going to talk to. Then she said, uh, he said that Grover Norquist recommended, you know, that he call you. So that made me feel a little bit more comfortable knowing Grover. And he writes for the American, well, Grover writes for a magazine called the American Spectator, right? So I heard American Spectator, not American Prospect, right? So I immediately got on the phone and said hello, and Josh uh, Green said, hi, Mr. Martin. Well, about 15 seconds into this interview, I realize I'm in deep doo-doo. He is coming hard left, and of course I'm coming rather slightly right of center, to put it mildly. Uh, after a few minutes of bantering back and forth, and he was making some derisive comments about the death tax and why we call it that, and isn't that a little disingenuous, and so forth and so on, and I finally said, look, Josh, I said, you write for the American Spectator? He said, no, I write for the American Prospect. And I'm going, oh, who is that? He said, well, our chairman is uh, Robert Rush. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm going, wow. So anyway, we went back and forth. And finally, I pulled out my ace in the hole I have to use occasionally. I said, look, Josh, I said, I'm a newspaper man myself. I have a degree in journalism. It's called a Bachelor of Science. I said, it is a science. It's not a little artsy thing where you can go out and editorialize all you want to. I said, maybe the, maybe news uh, gathering is different in these days, but that was the way I was brought up. It is a science. But if you're going to editorialize, fine, let's hang up and let it go at that. Or if you really want to know why we call it that, let me send you some material. I said, Josh, you're still there? I thought he hung up. <laughs> no, Mr. Martin, I'm still here. He got a little gruff. He said, all right, send me some material. I sent it over to him. And I waited, and I kept looking for this magazine, and I kept looking. It was coming out two weeks since. And finally, I said, well, the heck with it. You know, it's going to be a total butcher job. I get a phone call about two weeks later from a mutual friend of many of us in this room, John Gizzi, political editor of Human Events. 
John's been a friend of 20 years. He said, Martin, what are you doing talking to the American prospect? I said, oh my heavens, how bad is the article? He said, bad, heck, this is a great article coming from them. <laughs> he said, you ought to plaster the city with it because it's, oh, they take a few shots at you, but coming from this liberal publication, use it. And I said, okay, John, I said, by the way, why do you read them? He said, well, they read me and I read them. So anyhow, that's why we had death tax, the grim reaper's tax, grave robber's tax, exit tax, departure tax, cruel tax, stiffest tax of all, you, you know, <laughs> voluntary tax, a voluntary tax, and I want to mention that one especially because I want to tell Bill Gates and George Soros and, and Warren Buffett and those folks who said, uh, you know, that you ought to be able to... Uh, uh, you know, it, it should be kept for the common good. Well, baloney, look, let's call it a voluntary. If they want to pay it, go ahead. Here's the address of the IRS. Cut your check and mail it on in. But don't try to tell the 90-year-old tree farmer down in Mississippi, Chester Thigpen, the grandson of slaves, who's worked hard all of his life on that little tree farm, raised five kids. He's, um, he's not wealthy. He doesn't have the financial wherewithal to set up trusts and foundations. By the way, the word uh, death is kind of gruesome this early in the morning. kind of reminds me of a humorous little story I heard the other morning. Uh, this fellow was uh, robbing this home, and he goes into the home, and he was surprised to find the couple there. He thought the house was empty, and he looked at the couple, and he said, gee, he said, I hate to do this, but I can't leave any witnesses, so I'm going to have to shoot you. He said, before I do that, i got a little quirk. I'd like to know the names of my victims. He said, uh, lady, what's your name? And she replied, Helen. And he said, Helen? Oh, my, well, I can't really shoot you. My mother's name is Helen, so I'm going to let you live. By the way, what, sir, what's your name? He said, well, my name is Morton, but I'd like for you to call me Helen. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that was apropos of nothing, but I thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, the history of the death tax, we all know, it's been enacted three times during defense, uh, uh, time of defense, uh, Revolutionary War, Civil War, Spanish-American War, then again, World War I, and like some taxes in this town, it's been there ever since, for 86 years. And um, we, uh, you know, a tax should have some socially redeeming value. This one has none. I used to think it did, but it has none. Although there was a lawyer down in, I was giving a talk in Charleston, South Carolina, to the CNP a couple of years ago, and I said, well, Lawyers benefit, it's a cottage industry, and this attorney came up to me later, Harold Apolinsky may be the world's greatest expert on this law, uh, and he's trying to repeal it, although his law firm makes a lot of money because of the estate tax, the death tax, if you will. And he came up to me later and he said, Jim, there's, you're right on target except for one thing, it's not a cottage industry, it's big business with a capital B for lawyers, and I call it a lawyers and accountants relief act, if you will. Uh, we should get rid of it. It's not really a revenue raiser. It's probably a revenue loser in the long run. Uh, raised uh, 1% last year, $27 billion, and you know most of that's wasted on collection and compliance. I like to say that only the federal government can bring in $27 billion and not have a heck of a lot to show for it. So let's get rid of it. It discourages savings. It encourages consumption. Uh, Milton Friedman said, if you can believe the Nobel laureate saying something like this, and I'm obviously paraphrasing him, he said, it sends a bad message to, to it's an anti-savings message, as he said eloquently, uh, you may as well spend your money on wine, women, and song as to save it, because Uncle Sam is going to be the first claimant in line, uh, not even a blood relative, if you will, for up to 55% of your assets. So. I could go on and on. We, uh, we quote Edward McCaffrey, the liberal law professor, who testified before the House, uh, the Senate Finance Committee a few years ago, and he said that um, I'm here as an unrequited liberal, and I'm telling you this tax ain't doing what we redistributionists thought it should do, redistribute the wealth. He said we should now give serious thought to actually repealing it. And so when I found his testimony, uh, being a conservative, if I sent it around, the Democrats would have said, oh, well, that's a conservative. But we got a liberal Democrat who agreed with us on this to send, that, send around that testimony, you see, and we picked up some more sponsors. That's how we built a head of steam for this particular uh, repeal of this tax. McCaffrey also said, as the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial he did, uh, it's entitled, A Tax That Should Offend Liberals. I didn't know there was such an animal, but <laughs> apparently there is. Um, 
But we, uh, we worked from 1993 to 2000 to get repeal, and Chris Cox of California is the chief hero in this. He had less than two dozen sponsors when we got involved. There were no sponsors on the Senate side until John Kyle got elected in 1995. He had one sponsor. By 99, we had 270 sponsors in the House, 50-some in the Senate. Clinton vetoed it. You know, tax cut for the rich, windfall for the wealthy. Well, I got up, I said, that's the biggest con job of all con. In this town where con jobs are a daily occurrence, that's probably the biggest one of all. And Bill Clinton knows that, the policy walk he is. That's pure demagoguery. And we say, no, it's not. That horse is dead. Dismount. Do not use that demagoguery. The rich don't pay it. They set up trust and foundations. And who can blame them for doing that? But it's Chester Thigpen, that tree farmer I mentioned a while ago, that 90-year-old tree farmer. They're the ones. They don't have the liquidity. Let me, let me give you one example. Oprah Winfrey, a few years ago, had on her show a person about the rich and the famous. And we got a copy of the tape. We didn't want to misquote her. And she is saying, well, I explained this so-called estate tax. And the fellow explained it. And she said, wait a minute. I've paid up to 50% of my income while I'm alive. You mean that after I die, I want to leave this to my aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews, Uncle Sam can take me up to 55%. She said, well, we're going to go on commercial break here. She said, I must tell you, though, I find that irritating, to say the least. And I must tell you, I, I used her for about four years when I testify over in Annapolis and other places about repealing it. I said, Oprah Winfrey, I'll bet you she got off that show and she either fired all of her lawyers or called them in her room and said, look, I need a foundation. And they probably said, well, Ms. Winfrey, we need a couple hundred thousand dollars for insurance and this for the... And they, she probably said, look, cut the check, I'll sign it, don't bother me with details. But the average small entrepreneur does not have that type of liquidity, you see. She did. I said, I'll bet you there'll be an Oprah Winfrey Foundation. Well, four years of the month later, August of 97 was when that show appeared. August of 2001, I'm reading Investor's Business Daily. And there's a great success story about Oprah Winfrey. And I'm scanning it, and down in the bottom of the story, it says, the recently formed Oprah Winfrey Foundation, and it went on to talk about that. So the proof is in the pudding. Who can blame her for doing that, you see? Um, we uh, worked with Chris Cox and John Kyle for a number of years to get repealed. We had an inside the beltway and outside the beltway strategy. And let me mention the uh, outside the beltway first. That's direct mail. And Richard Vigory being the godfather, the funding father, Morton, you're absolutely right, the funding father. Direct mail that we use to contact like-minded seniors around the country to write and send postcards to their members of the House and the Senate. Uh, I call it... Uh, BRL, before Rush Limbaugh, it was Richard Vigory delivering the mail through the Himalayas so conservatives could talk to each other. You couldn't get word in the, uh, the Washington Post or the New York Times. That was before the Washington Times, obviously. So that was uh, outside the Beltway. Inside the Beltway, we did everything from testifying before the House Ways and Means Committee, Small Business Committee. We had, had a poll done. 73 to 77 percent of the public would vote for their member if they voted to get rid of the death tax. Were they affected by it? Of course not. They cited one reason, the unfairness. The American public is fair-minded. They said that's an unfair tax. It's a tax on after-tax assets. You know, the, you know the history of that. We uh, took the, all politicians like poll numbers like that. So we took it to other Democrat, to some Democrats who believed in it as we did it. They circulated that among members showing that and this cut across philosophical lines. Um, we also came up with what we call the Benjamin Franklin Award. Franklin said there are two certainties in life, death and taxes. Well, because of this particular one, we said there's a third certainty, it's taxes after death. So we came up with a little Benjamin Franklin Award and we had a photo op. And to show you how this works, we picked, Chris Cox picked up 20 to 22 new sponsors. Not that they changed their minds, these were Republicans who should have been sponsors of the bill if something had you know, had, had slipped by their legislative staff or whatever. But we'd sent out a blast fact saying we were having a photo op if you're a sponsor of the bill to repeal. And a member of Congress, I won't mention him, he called me up and he said, Jim, I'll be at that photo op. I said, well, Congressman, are you on Chris Cox's bill? He said, no, you know, I don't think I am, but I, I want to get that Benjamin Franklin Award and photo and the press release, you know. And I said, well, you got to, sir, you got to sign up. Okay, I will. Well, he called Cox's office and apparently the Congressman wasn't in. And he said, uh, he talked to the legislative director. He told me he was, he said, you tell Chris I'm on that bill because I want to be at that photo shoot. 
to get his Benjamin Franklin Award. So they use this. They use it in the paper back home. Um, there are lots of other things that we, we did along the line. We had a questionnaire. Uh, we uh, double weighted these freshman members coming in. I went out and campaigned with 15 House members and five Senate members this year, and I had them sign up. They had to take, yes, I'll co-sponsor a death tax repeal if I'm elected. I did do one state Senate race, Alex Mooney. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't resist when they asked me to come up. Listen, the contrast, one day I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina with Liddy Dole and the day before with Saxby Chambliss and I was with Norm Coleman and two days later I'm with Alex Mooney. And that did me as much good as being with those big shots. Alex is a rising star in the conservative firmament and you can count on that. So I went up and, and worked with Alex. Uh, let me close on this note. There are lots of other anecdotes I could tell you about. Uh, will we get repealed now? No, it's phased out over 10 years. I don't want to go into all that. I just I tell everybody to listen to me, including the president. i got a bunch of seniors who can't wait 10 years, Mr. President. Uh, he, he, uh, he's with us on the issue. He wants, he wants repeal. We just have to get up ahead of steam, get our seniors roused up, and get repeal moved to the year 2003. Um, Jennifer Dunn of, uh, of uh, Washington came up with, uh, with a bill to phase out, if you will, and she, she has a great quote. She says, only in America are we uh, issued a certificate at birth, a, a, a license at marriage, and a bill at death. So I'm saying that we ought to uh, get rid of this tax a fourth and final time. It's an anti-business tax, a job-robbing tax, if you will. Let me close on this note. I have these buttons, and Anita Bradbury always wears her kill the death tax button. We have one, I'm a compassionate conservative, and I was, yes, and I was wearing these uh, at a conference a year or so ago, CPAC, and I had them on, I was giving a talk, and there was a reporter who came up to me later, and he said, Mr. Martin, isn't that a little bit incongruous, kill and compassion? And this reporter was from the New York Times, so you can imagine where he was coming from, and I tried to explain to him, no, we thought it was pretty compassionate to try to kill a tax that hurts uh, farmers like Chester Thigpen, the 90-year-old farmer down in Mississippi, that this was very compassionate in my mind. He kept saying, well, I don't care what you say, that still is rather in the incongruity of all kill. I said, well, maybe I should have said abolish. But, you know, I wanted to make a point. Kill it. Let's don't wound it. Let's kill it. Black flag dead, if you will. Uh, compassion and concern. So he wouldn't take this for an answer, and I finally said, well, look, why don't we call it a mercy killing, if you will. All right? so, Anyhow, I see my time is up. I sincerely, sincerely thank you for yours. It's been an honor to be here with you today. Thank you again. Thank you. Jim will take a couple of questions if anybody has a question, and here's some Can enthusiasm. Can I ask you a question on Social Security? Yes, sir. We used to only be taxed uh, on Social Security. be taxed on only half of it. Yeah. Uh, and the other half, in fact, we never used to be taxed. Right. Then they taxed half, left the half that we'd already paid taxes on. Then Clinton uh, got us to be taxed on 85%. Is there any possibility of that ever being rolled back? Yes, I'm sure glad you asked that question. Uh, that's what I hear all over the country, when I went into these races, that's the first question I get. I'm on Social Security. I've been drawing it now for almost two years, and I daggone sure don't like the idea that it's taxed after paying in for 45 years. We're working on that. That's a major issue now with the 60-plus association. And uh, by the way, when I say that Roger Zine and I get around and do most of these things, let me tell you, too, the staff at 60-plus, whether it's Hank Huff, and many of you remember Colonel Huff. He's now on the West Coast running the operation in California. It's Amy Frederick, who's our vice president, or Melissa Puckett, Carla Nelson, Ed Fulgeniti, who's new with us, Amanda McGuire, Hugh Newton, who's been around almost as long, maybe longer than I have, too. I've been in this town about 40 years. But these folks work awfully hard on the issues that you just mentioned, Vern. We will get that tax lifted. If we can get a standalone on it like we did on lifting that earnings limit on seniors between 65 and 69. Let me comment too. Richard mentioned how we go out on these campaigns on Social Security. You know, these folks that quote lie about it that Republicans are going to throw grandma out in the snow. Here's what I did. 
I've used a little, I picked up on the theme by doing all these House and Senate races. If you use a little humor, it goes a long way. I'm with Liddy Dole in Raleigh. And before I give her the prize, I said, I'm honored to be down here to give you this Pro Senior Award, Mrs. Dole. And I know your mother, her, her mother, I think is 99. I said, look, before I give you the award, I want to make a comment about Social Security. I said, first of all, I draw it. My favorite senior draws it. My mom, my sainted mom, if you will, who's 80-plus, uh, still can't tell her age. His son never gets old enough to tell his mom's age, I guess. My second favorite senior, my stepfather. I said, now this gentleman is a tricenturian. And somebody said, Jim, there's no such thing as a tricenturian. I said, well, look, he was born September 25th, 1899. He started in the 19th. He's lived through the entire 20th. He's working on the 21st century. That's, he's 103 years old. So he's drawing Social Security, and I don't want him to take it away. So when these folks say they're going to take it away, I don't like to use the word lie. I'm from the old school, and, we, and I'm talking to a bunch of seniors in the room down there, white hairs, if you will, uh, who are in their 70s and 80s and beyond. And I said, look, we seniors, remember, we don't like to use the word lie. But you remember when you told a, uh, maybe you used a cuss word, or you told a fib, your mama threatened to wash your mouth out with soap. So I think when Erskine Bowles says that you're going to take away Social Security, Mrs. Dole, you ought to perhaps wash his mouth out with soap. And by that time, everybody said, "Raw." And so she comes up and thanked me, and she says, Jim, i got to tell you, I think that's a great idea. And that lady in the front row said, Liddy, lead him over by the ear to the wash basin and wash his mouth out with soap. <laughs> so with a little humor, you're saying they're lying <laughs> without saying it. I use that all over the country, and it helps... Uh, I saw the fear in seniors' eyes, believe me. Some, in, I was in Indiana with Chris Chicola, who got elected. And right, right after we did our thing, this lady said, but Mr. Chicola, we hear about Social Security privatization. And he said, well, let Jim. I said, we're not talking about the market fluctuation of now. We're talking about a 44-year period. Why 44? You usually go into workforce at 21. You work 44 years, retire at 65. Show me. I defy you to tell me when the market's ever gone down over that 40 I could see the fear leaving her eyes, you see, because they had planted this idea that she's on social and somebody that the market's down a little bit. We're not talking about the fluctuations over a year, two years, or five. We're talking about a 40-some year cycle. So this is how 60-plus went out and campaigned in these races uh, on that particular issue. Uh, George Bush did tell me in the Oval Office back in, boy, I wish I had this on tape, <laughs> believe me. Uh, back in a few months ago, I was there, and I had a friend up from Orlando. We'd worked together in the, in the Senator Gurney campaign. Many of you remember Senator Gurney, uh, great conservative. And I'm in there, and um, we did the photo stuff, and we're talking, and he's talking to this fellow from Orlando. And turns to me without my asking, he says, Jim, well, he said, Buddha. <laughs> he did. He said, Buddha, I won the senior vote in Florida. And I know it's thanks to you. And I, I said, Mr. President, is the Nixon taping system still on? <laughs> but one final word on the Buddha bit. Yes, he likes to say now that Jim in the old days drank some beer and didn't really exercise a lot. A lot of people drank beer in those days, as I recall. Uh, he says he still drinks a beer, but he works out. I play on a senior, three senior basketball teams. I play on a senior softball team. I swim about a mile a day. And some of my kids said, Pop, is that real basketball? I said, sure. I said, it's not. Look, when you see the video, that's not slow motion. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> when you're all the same age, you think you're flying. Anyhow, uh, I thank you for your question. Any, anybody else? Uh, yes, sir. One more. That's it. Well, I mentioned that briefly a minute ago, and by the way, he has a book coming out in January. He and others to talk about how they think that they should, you know, what you should do with your wealth. Again, I say it's a voluntary tax. If he wants to voluntarily pay it, go ahead and pay it and send it on to the IRS. But don't try to tell somebody who's worked hard all their life they don't have that. You know, Gates, it's kind of funny. His son is so rich, he's got two foundations, not one. And Mr. And, and Buffett said, Oh, I'm not going to leave my four or five billion to my kids. Well, what are you going to leave? Mom's just going to leave them $10 million. Well, you know, come on, folks. That's more than the average estate anyway. But so he's just going to leave them, you know, some uh, petty cash, $10 million. I think it's wrong. 
Uh, we're going to put out a book review when that book comes out in January. It won't be very favorable, I can tell you right now. But um, it, it's just it's ludicrous to me that they can do that and try to tell you what to do with your money. It reminds me, you know, it's the third tenet of the Communist Manifesto, abolition of all right of inheritance. That's the mind mentality you fight in Washington. And uh, one final thought, George McGovern in the 1972 campaign, and this audience remember those, some of those campaigns, when his campaign was going nowhere that year, McGovern perhaps came up, he came up with a cockamamie idea, if you will, uh, not like the Communist Manifesto ab abolition of all right of inheritance. He said you should be able to keep $500,000 and the rest should revert to the Treasury for the common good. Now, when that idea went nowhere, and he still lost overwhelmingly in post-election polling, they were asking the tip of a young McGovern work, uh, voter, the 25, 30-year-old factory worker, steel worker, if you will. But why didn't you favor it? In almost in exasperation, the pollster says, but you don't have that type of wealth. Why do you oppose it? No, not now, but I might. You see, it's the American dream. That's why it didn't fly then. That's why we're going to get rid of it. Thank you very much for your attention. Jim, I want to thank you very much uh, for coming here. You are an inspiration to anybody who uh, is interested in supporting conservative principles. You've been a highly successful organizational entrepreneur. Uh, you talk with any uh, conservative member of the Congress and you mention the name Jim Martin, face lights up because Jim Martin has been there assisting them, giving them senior awards, getting them an immense amount of favorable publicity, giving them advice about how to best use issues that are important to seniors. Jim Martin is doing extraordinary uh, work for conservative principles in this country. One thing which I didn't say because it wasn't my place to introduce him, but, but I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge this when I uh, first went to work at the Vigory Company in the late spring of the, the year 1972, Jim Martin was my immediate supervisor, which means that I have this in common with the President of the United States. I once worked directly uh, for, for Jim Martin. <laughs> um, Jim, I want to, as a token of our appreciation, uh, present to you a souvenir, uh, which is a, 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 a beautiful silk Adam Smith tie. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Morton, for the tie. I didn't expect this. Uh, I, I don't think I deserve it, but like Jack Benny once said, he didn't deserve an award he got, but he said, on the other hand, I have arthritis, and I don't think I deserve that either. So, <laughs> so I'll accept it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Here's your folder. Or, or is this Richard? Yeah, that's Richard. Okay. Okay, I would like to invite you to join us next month at our Wednesday Wake Up Club, Club breakfast. And you know our breakfasts are traditionally on the first Wednesday of the month. However, the first Wednesday of next month is New Year's Day. And we don't expect many would be interested in, uh, in, in coming uh, here in the middle of the holidays or to even towards the end of the holidays. And therefore, next month, it will be on the second Wednesday, which is the 8th of January. And our special guest at that breakfast will be an outstanding graduate of the Leadership Institute who has a, a remarkable success story. Um, and his name is Scott Stewart, and he's chairman of the College Republican National Committee. Just to give you a little hint, um, in this past campaign, Scott Stewart placed, after having almost entirely raised the money himself, 33 Leadership Institute trained field staff organizing college students across America in these races. And last weekend, um, uh, 
Saturday, Sunday, uh, three of his uh, field staff came up with Helen and me to the Briar Patch and we debriefed them about what they did in that exciting campaign. There would have been more of them, but uh, eight of those 33 just happened to have, after the November 5th election, signed on uh, to go down to uh, 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 Louisiana, and eight of them are right now working full-time uh, in the state of Louisiana. Scott Stewart is a wonder, and you need to, to be here to hear uh, what he has to say. Um, guests who would like a tour, and a couple of you, as we were coming in, uh, expressed interest in seeing the place. Uh, Kevin Vitrano, Kevin, where are you? Step on up here. Kevin will uh, conduct a tour. Uh, he, he, he'll be coming up here, and anybody interested in a tour of the building, we would be delighted to have uh, you walk around with Kevin. He will depart immediately upon adjournment and coming up here. Uh, we'll, we'll wait a minute for those who want to assemble, and we are adjourned. Thank you.